the 29th century had witnessed the rise of a crusader for justice, one that catapulted a small shuttle manufacturer to one of the most influential companies of the UEE. But even the mightiest must eventually fall, as inexperience and lack of conviction would eventually lead to a growing six-tailed snake to loom over paradise. My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a series where I talk about all things sci-fi and space lore. This is the last of a short series of videos discussing the rise and fall of Crusader Industries. If you haven't, make sure you've seen the first two episodes before watching this one to ensure you know the entire story. Before I get started, I'd like to thank you all for watching these videos. Your support has been tremendous, and it means a lot that you chose to watch this video today. If this isn't your first time watching one of these videos, be sure you've hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to hear more stories from the verse. Now, let's conclude with the fall of the House of Dunlow and the rise of the Nine Tails. By 2940, cracks were showing in Crusader Industries' shell. While they were still one of the most successful businesses in the UEE, their decision to buy the low-mass gas giant, Crusader II, was proving to be a strain. Kaplan seems to earnestly want to ensure the health and happiness of the residents of Orison, but control of the space outside of the city was temporary at best, especially when it came to their moons. This is illustrated by the fate of what has become known as Grimhex. Completed in 2903, the station was built to allow groups of independent miners to mine the mineral wealth around the third moon of Crusader, known as Yella. Crusader approved the construction of a Green Imperial Housing Exchange Station as part of Kaplan's plan to sublet outposts to other companies. It was built in one of the larger asteroids of the belt around the moon, which was designed as an extended-stay miniature town, with all the amenities required for the miners to live and work around the moon. While initially successful, the mineral wealth of the belt began to dry up in 2933 and soon the station could no longer make enough credits to stay open, and was forced to shutter its doors by 2938. Shortly after the last legal resident had left, the station was reopened by squatters, who gave new life to the facility. Initially, they were no more than harmless vagrants and petty criminals, so Crusader largely ignored them. However, by 2943, a more violent group arrived that would change the station and the entire Stanton system forever. The same year that Green Imperial ceased operations in Stanton, a prison transport and its escorts were ambushed and ripped out of quantum travel above Terra. Quickly, the escorts were efficiently and ruthlessly destroyed, and the transport was disabled. The resulting boarding action killed every single police officer on the ship, rescuing only one prisoner. He was the leader of the Rangda Syndicate of Terra Prime, Albert Sinkhole Holden. Investigators after the fact were puzzled, as the attack had all the hallmarks of professionals, but they left one of their own dead behind, which was unusual. The only identifying mark was a picture of a snake entwined over a nine on the corpse of the dead assailant. They believed this was a red herring and planted by the Rangda Syndicate who was truly responsible for the rescue to throw off any future investigation. However, that changed when a day after the raid, Holden was found dead in space with a single bullet to his head. No one knows why the group went to all the trouble of freeing Holden only to kill the syndicate leader themselves. The group was next seen in a heist of a caterpillar filled with valuable resources over Magnus and over the next several years, the gang became more and more prolific and were linked to incidents in over a dozen systems that involved abductions, murderers, robberies, and the destruction of public and private property. Soon, they became known as the Nine Tails. While it's unknown if they called themselves by that name at the start, they do seem to embrace the name now. But most insiders from the gang seem to refer to themselves as simply the Nines. But there is still some confusion as to the iconography and meaning behind the gang itself. Their colors are consistent, a dark blue, turquoise, and neon pink, 
And while their main symbol is a stylized nine using blocks, the rest of their gang attire seems to indicate different origins for the name. On their armor, they often have the Japanese kanji for the mythic nine-tailed fox known as the Kitsune. This creature is a shape-shifting trickster demon who can cause misfortune to others, but can also be seen as a positive protector spirit. However, lower level gang members wear jackets with a snake wrapped around a number nine. Snakes are also part of Japanese mythology, but are also fairly prevalent in Japanese organized crime in the form of tattoos. These are worn as symbols of good and bad luck, often interpreted as to mean there is power and wisdom in going through bouts of bad luck and bad times, that through the struggle, you can be mighty. While it isn't certain, I would speculate that the Nine Tails have adopted the ancient Japanese icons as a way of grounding their gangs in the identity of the Yakuza of old. The fact that their lower level enforcers are the only ones to wear the snake is symbolic of them having to do their time before rising the ranks. This would mean that their name actually is a reference to the Kitsune, as their higher level gang members proudly inscribe their armor with the proper kanji. Thus, they seem to revel in being powerful agents of chaos, like the nine-tailed fox of legend. After four years of seemingly random attacks, in early 2942, incidents involving the nine tails suddenly stopped. Law enforcement officials secretly hoped that internal divisions might have finally ripped the gang apart, but they were soon to be proven wrong, as they re-emerged in the old Green Imperial Station around Yella, now known as Grimhex. The Nine Tails made the residents a simple offer, either support the Nines or die. The residents put up little resistance to the takeover. According to sources, anyone who opposed the gang got tossed out an airlock, while those offering no objections were allowed to stay and potentially prosper. They protected their new home fiercely and established a working relationship with the local smuggling ring, partially run by Wallace Klim, and a local info broker known as Rudo. Together, the Nine Tails began to expand their operations, reaching the full length of the Stanton system. Initially, when confronted by Crusader security, residents of Grimhex denied that the Nine Tails had set up shop in their station. But by the time this was proven to be untrue, the Nine Tails had grown far too large for Crusader security alone, who was proving to be far too under-equipped and trained to deal with the escalating threat. They refused any kind of direct assault unless assisted by the UEE advocacy or military forces, as there were, and still are, civilians on the station being used as, effectively, human shields by the Nine Tails, as well as an unknown number of forces protecting the station. As a result, there has been a crime wave that has swept through the Stanton system. The Nine's activity has possibly encouraged other rival gangs to set up shop, like the Dusters and the Nova Riders. And they are almost assuredly directly responsible for the rise of a powerful rival syndicate, the Otoni Syndicate, setting up shop in Stanton, as their injuring of Ticia Pacheco caused her to lose her job with Blackjack Security and into the arms of the Syndicate, setting up the potential for a gang war fought for the future of Stanton. A topic for another video. They also led to one of the most influential events in the system's history, the Jumptown Wars. A drop in the price of minerals caused a strain on many local independent traders' livelihoods. At the same time, due to a rise in criminal activity and lack of oversight, a lab was built inside an abandoned research outpost on Yella, nicknamed Jumptown, to produce the popular recreational drug known as Widow. Local smugglers had been buying the drug and selling it in Grimhex for some time. However, when the word got out that there was a significant profit to be made, former legitimate haulers and mercenaries got in on the deal. This caused a full-blown drug war, with various groups vying for control of the lab and the incredible profits to be had. While this is speculation, considering the Nines controlled the station and thus the flow of drugs, they also likely made the most profit acting as go-betweens between users and those shipping the drugs to the station, with Wallace Klim acting as their dealer and distributor for the rest of the system, and Rudo to contract enforcers to maintain their control over the Widow trade. Thus, their sudden rise from a small gang to a massive system-wide syndicate begins to make sense. 
It is at this point that the UEE government began to recognize that Kaplan and Crusader were no longer in control of the situation, routinely requesting her presence in Congressional Committee on the Interior to answer for the rise of criminal activity in the system she was trusted to maintain order in. The UEE was nervous because similar situations had played out to devastating effects multiple times. Both the Nexus and Pyro systems were claimed by corporations that fell apart shortly after, allowing for violent criminal elements to take root and become major hazards for surrounding UEE systems. The government was already dealing with the financial and political fallout of having been forced to retake Nexus from criminal groups that had called the system home for almost 300 years, and they did not want a repeat of Nexus in Stanton. In response, Crusader offered a solution to the problem through the creation of Crusader Cares, a program to increase security spending and outsource some of their security concerns to small independent pilots and orgs. This was the brainchild of Intende Wilkins, a brilliant and resourceful young up-and-comer who had headed the Crusader-sponsored Operation Sword of Hope to bring relief supplies and aid to the war-torn planet of Charon. His experience in working with mercenaries and security personnel, while not upsetting the humanitarian crisis on the planet, made him the most qualified to deal with the spiraling crime situation in the system. It is yet to be determined if this initiative has proven successful, but it does mark the start of a change in how Crusader Industries has approached its business. While the company still donates most of its profits to charities, more and more of these profits are going into just keeping the peace in the system a piece that seems to be a losing battle, as the Ninetales are only getting stronger year to year. Nothing illustrates this change better than the most recent Crusader ship to be developed, a massive departure from their trade and cargo ships of the past, their first dedicated combat ship, the Ares Starfighter. The ship itself was built in 2949 in collaboration with Baring who were asked to build a brand new weapon for the company's first offensive ship. This weapon was the size 7 Bering SF-7. The purpose of the ship seems to be directly related to the rise in crime in the Stanton system, a ship designed to combat the increasing threat of the Ninetales, who have managed to acquire multiple large ships, including at least one Idris-class frigate. The SF-7 was built in two variants, the energy-based SF-7E and the ballistic-based SF-7B. As a result, there was two distinct variants of the Ares constructed, with the SF-7E going into the Ion and the SF-7B going into the Inferno, both designed to work together in packs to deal with ground and space-based targets, specifically the larger threats that lurked in the Stanton system. In the end, the Ares is still a Crusader ship and has the same ruggedness and ease of maintenance as its older relatives and is seen by Crusader as a smaller yet more practical solution to frontier defense against larger sub-capital and capital ships, both of which are more and more ending up in the hands of larger criminal organizations, especially in fringe frontier systems. The ship only released at the end of last year, 2951, and has some mixed reactions from users. Unfortunately for Crusader, the ship did not make it in time to deal with the biggest direct threat that the Nines have ever attempted against the company. In August of 2951, the Ninetales blockaded one of the Crusader-owned L-Point stations. Crusader security was forced to call in local mercenaries to deal with the issue. While eventually the Ninetales did retreat from their blockade, the full purpose of the entire event is still unknown. However, the Ninetales have repeated this over and over for almost the entire year, putting pressure on Crusader security who has routinely been forced to rely more on contract help. A pattern has begun to emerge. As Ninetales have grown more bold, Crusader security has struggled to keep the peace, with more of their supposedly safe zones being infringed upon. Now, the threat is looming over the Prayer City itself, as rumors of a Ninetales action on the city of Orison have begun to circulate an action that may break the backs of the overstretched group and bring the horrors of these self-styled demons to the front door of paradise. It seems like the house that Dunlow built is teetering on the edge of disaster. A disaster where a single group or person like yourself might be the difference between chaos and order. 
between keeping the dream alive or seeing it fall to ruin. For now, only time will tell. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the rise and fall of Crusader Industries. Be sure to stay up to date with future videos like this by subscribing to the channel. I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'd like to thank those on screen now who support me on Patreon to keep this content going. I'm currently trying to raise enough to hire an editor who can help me increase the quality and quantity of videos coming, including a timed Patreon exclusive where I cover the entire history of the Star Citizen universe, from the very beginning of what we know to today. If that sounds like something you enjoy, think about joining my Patreons for as little as $5 a month. Now, what do you think? Is Crusader doomed to fall? What is the long-term plan of the Nine Tails? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, remember, Exhistoria at Astra.